Good morning and welcome to this featured presentation on techniques for perception and means of encounter. I'm Dr. Mandy McMichael. I'm the Assistant Professor of Religion and Associate Director of Ministry Guidance in Baylor's Religion Department. So uh, welcome to campus. Whoever brought the rain with you, we are grateful. So I hope that you will enjoy this time. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Heidi J. Hornick, who is Professor of Italian Renaissance and Baroque Art History and Chair of the Department of Art and Art History at Baylor. She received her BA from Cornell University and MA and PhD from the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Hornick was awarded a Visiting Scholar Residency Fellowship at Harvard University and was also a Visiting Fellow at St. Edmunds College, Cambridge University. In June 2022, she was ex accepted as an affiliate faculty member of the Digital Humanities at Baylor. Dr. Hornick was also named the 2015 Outstanding Mentor of the Year for Research, a recognition awarded by the Undergraduate Research Scholarly Achievement Office of Baylor. And in spring 2022, she was inducted as a member of the Dean's Club of the Honors College at Baylor. She has published eight peer-reviewed books, two solo authored books on about Italian Renaissance painter Michele Tozzini and on Christian ethics reflected in art respectively, four co-edited, co-authored volumes with Dr. Michael Parsons and two co-edited volumes. Dr. Hornick has served as founding co-chair and or committee member of the Bible and Visual Arts section of the SBL for over 20 years. On August 31st, 2022, Dr. Hornick, as founding editor and, ch and chief of Venue, a digital journal of the Midwest Art History Society, published the first edition of this peer-reviewed scholarly journal. Her presentation today is titled, Renaissance Painting Techniques and the Shaping of Audience Perception. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hornick. Thank you, Dr. McMichael, and uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffrey and Dr. Davis for uh, having me here today. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than probably some of the presentations you've uh, witnessed and participated in during this symposium. Uh, it's going to be much more like a master class. So what I'd like to do today is, in addition to talking about Italian Renaissance and Baroque painting techniques, also talk about how the audience perceived those techniques, why they were uh, discovered, invented, utilized, created, uh, and also how we use them today in our research, scholarship, uh, and teaching. Well, let's try this. Okay. All right, so I'd like to begin with, um, and I, I know many of you are scholars of the Renaissance and Baroque, so uh, pardon me if this, is, this beginning slide is too basic for you. But of course, the characteristics of the Italian Renaissance and Baroque are these four fundamental uh, perceptions. Revival of Greek and Roman art, uh, the rise of humanism, the rise of the position of the artist from craftsmen to uh, educated academic individual, and inventive, inventive painting techniques and audience perception, which will be the topic today. And you can't really begin a conversation, I think, about the Renaissance without at least showing Michelangelo's David. Of course, the famous 14-foot, 4-inch uh, sculpture, today still in Florence, in the Accademia del Disegno, and roughly proportional to its both source and precedent for Michelangelo, Polycletus's Doriferous. So if we begin to talk about compositional painting techniques, the introduction of oil was incredibly important for the Italian artists. I will make some references to Northern Renaissance, but this paper and presentation really focuses on Italian culture. So Hugo van der Hoos, who was a Northern Renaissance Netherlandish artist, created the Portinari altarpiece that you see in front of you here from 1475 to 1476, and it is oil on wood. Many of you have probably seen it in the Uffizi, uh, 
Um, it is placed right alongside the other 15th century Italian pictures so that you realize, um, hopefully as you, as you study it, that this was influential directly on the Florentine artists. Uh, Portinari was uh, an Italian commissioner or agent of the Medici and he literally had this brought to Florence so that a Florentine artist could study and learn oil technique. And this really changes things in terms of um, realistic color, portrayal of line, composition, and of course, um, when you have that kind of clarity, uh, iconographic elements. Here you see it in the Uffizi. Uh, the Uffizi reinstalled their galleries right before COVID in 2019. Uh, quite frankly, I liked better where it was before. Um, it was more integrated with the Botticelli's, but right now it, it still attracts lots of attention and is um, in a beautiful location. The next thing is linear perspective. And you may be thinking, well, of course, the Renaissance developed linear perspective. This was, this was really not an of course. This was a, a very much a humanistic, um, almost a triune type of collaboration between this artist, Masaccio, and the architect Brunelleschi, who was working out the same principles of one-point linear perspective in architecture, and Leon Battista Alberti, who was both an architect and a humanistic writer, who codified all this and wrote it down. And he wrote it down in 1435 in um, Latin, and then very quickly translated it in 1436 into Italian. So all the workshops and anyone who could read could then really understand this mathematical system to have orthogonals, which I don't know if the pointer works, but you can see the, the lines of the architecture, all converge on one vanishing point at roughly five foot 10, which would be eye level of the uh, normal Italian. So this was one of the first, um, in, in 1526, first indications now that um, it was no longer the flat, elongated forms of the medieval world, but in fact, humanism and the proper proportions of, of man, as well as all of the icon iconography, which is a whole other lecture for this picture, as many of you know, um, all begins now in Florence. And here you see it in, um, that's a typo there, sorry about that, in Santa Maria Novella. So it has not been moved, of course it is a fresco, and it was um, for a, uh, a private burial chapel for the Lindsay family. The next um, atmospheric perspective is the next painting technique that I want to touch on. And of course, you recognize Leonardo da Vinci's Annunciation. Notice the medium, oil and tempera on poplar panel. Like so many of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, such as the famous Last Supper, he liked to experiment with painting techniques. So he often took a pure technique, tempera, or oil, or fresco, and he mixes things up, literally and figuratively. So what we have here is still a painting that's in very, very good condition, also recently restored um, by the Uffizi and given a new location. Um, but he is now incorporating oil into his composition. In addition to that, he is developing the atmospheric perspective technique that you can see in the back third of the composition. Now, why is this important? It's important because it complements linear perspective. You can have one point linear perspective which conveys um, three dimensional space on a two dimensional surface, but what happens when you get to the background? What happens when you want something to look um, as it does in nature? It gets hazy. You can look out our windows and you can see also in the rain what happens. And so he develops this, this softening technique that allows linear perspective to be continued into an atmospheric haze. And here you see it installed. And also I like very much to show pictures with other people um, because you can get a good sense of the size. So if you're going to teach art, I suggest that in your lectures. Um, and there's a nice detail of that um, atmospheric perspective behind the Book of Mary. The next technique is foreshortening. 
And that, again, seems very um, <clears throat> routine, uh, but very complicated to paint. If you come over to my building and go down to some of our drawing classes, you'll see all of these freshmen and sophomore students really struggling with foreshortening. It is not as easy as it looks. What does it do for the audience perception here? It brings us front and center as we lament over the dead body of Christ. So what, what could be very awkward is now, does now become very devotional. And this is by Montaigne, the northern artist who works, uh, worked many years also in Florence. Um, and he is still using tempera. And remember, tempera is an egg-based paint. So the, it dries quicker and um, usually is not as translucent or as reflective as oil. And here you see um, from a recent photograph up in the Pinacoteca di Brera um, in Milano so that you can uh, kind of get a sense also of proportion. The next technique moves us into the Baroque. And just to remind you, because the, the style names are different, say, in music than they are in art. Um, for the Renaissance, we begin about pre-Renaissance 1310 to 1380 with Giotto and Cimabue, if those names sound familiar. And then really the Renaissance is the 15th century, up through the death of Raphael in 1520. And then you have a brief transition period called Mannerism from 1520 to 1590, and then begins the Baroque. So the Baroque now really is late, very late 16th century and all of 17th century. So you see artists here who are born, um, such as Guido Reni in 1575, living till um, mid-century of the 17th century. Now our term here is quadri riportati. What that literally means is repositioned panel or repositioned quadrant, okay? So the physical object is painted and then it is given a frame. So it looks like it is an easel painting that has been lifted up to the arch of a um, ceiling. So it is a type of illusion that very much changes audience perception. So the 15th century spends all this time getting us one point linear perspective, making sure we see depth, making sure that we understand um, the recession of a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional surface. And now we can push that further with the Baroque and we can actually put things above our head that have the illusion of being paintings that would be normally on the wall framed, okay? And you see it's large, 9.2 feet by 23 feet. It is still in situ in the Palazzo Raspigliosi in Rome. And you can just, this is the best slide I had of it, but you can see it up there positioned. So again, the in situ for this conversation is very important because of the audience perception. What was this room used for? Probably um, banquets, dancing. It was not a meeting hall. It was a festive or entertainment hall. And so the, um, the Aurora subject here, also a very joyful beginning of the day, um, rejuvenation, um, kind of a great party theme. And then, then we can take that one step further with quadratura. Um, and quadratura is complete illusionistic painting where when you see it from one angle, one point in the middle of the room, it works beautifully. When you, there it is, working beautifully. And then when you shift your perspective, you shift, shift your uh, audience perception, it falls apart. And so this, this kind of play with perspective, play with the room, play with the ceiling, with the walls, um, really becomes something that is, that is a very modern concept. Once again, this is not church, these are not church commissions as I began with, but instead um, wealthy villas meant for entertaining and um, festive creations. Back to religious works. So with uh, Sfumato, probably many of you know Sfumato, um, probably the best, best way to discuss this is when you see signs throughout Italy that, me, that say non fumare, it's no smoking, right? And sfumato is related to that, and sfumare is a haze. Uh, 
Sfumato takes atmospheric perspective away from just the atmosphere and allows you to use it throughout the composition to blur lines. And Leonardo da Vinci was the master of this. Once again, he is um, oil on panel. Um, so he's, he's now working completely in oil. It was transferred to canvas later on for preservation reasons. And this is, there are two versions of this, one in London in the National Gallery and one here, the Paris Louvre that I show you. And so the sfumato occurs, I, again, I don't think my pointer's working, but if you look at the areas of the Virgin's mantle and how, they inter, how it intersects and blends with the background and the plants, uh, Leonardo loved botany. Uh, every one of these plants has been identified. Um, and so he creates this kind of blend of Mary, both in the, um, in the, the, the spiritual realm with Christ and John the Baptist and the angel directing us into the composition with this more cosmic landscape, um, this, this earthly landscape as well, um, seen first at her level and then in the background. And, and then we move to chiaroscuro. Let me take a drink of water here. Chiaroscuro is light and shade. So you have areas that are used to accentuate faces, objects, instruments of the passion, instruments of recognition, identifiable characteristics of saints, etc. And so you see it on the face here of um, Artemisia Gentileschi's St. Catherine of Alexandria. So where you see the, the light, which is coming from external from the composition, from the right side, it bathes her, her face in um, both light or at clarity and more obscurity or darkness. And this is a wonderful modeling technique that is taught still today, of course. Uh, most of these techniques are still taught. Um, very necessary, but all developed during the Renaissance and the Baroque. And I did want to mention that Artemisia Gentileschi, as a female artist, there are several artists, um, female artists before Artemisia, um, and there's much work, wonderful work being done on each of those artists. But Artemisia really is the, the one that we have right now, at least, who is the most documented as working for kings and queens of France, of England, as well as the duchies um, of Milan and the king of Naples. So there's a lot going on here finally now for women. Um, and so I, I did want to mention that about Artemisia. And she does many, many works that incorporate most of these techniques. And this is exactly what her audience wanted her to do. Um, they wanted her to use these, these brown graking techniques of chiaroscuro, of sfumato, and a couple others that I'm about to, uh, to go through. And here you see it today in the uh, Uffizi. Again, very important for size. Um, and I like this because she shares, the, uh, she shares the room with Caravaggio, who of course, well, you can see his, his, um, his uh, head there um, to the right. And, uh, and that's wonderful because she was a Caravaggisti. Uh, she knew Caravaggio, her father was a very good friend, also a painter, Orazio Gentileschi was a very good friend of Caravaggio's, and she was definitely a Caravaggesque painter in her own right. And then um, a follower of um, Artemisia Gentileschi and a contemporary, there was a lot of exchange of ideas, but um, he also was very heavily influenced by her, is in my example of tenebrous light lighting. Uh, tenebrism or um, tenebrous lighting is a theatrical lighting. And this immediately changes the way someone perceives a painting. When you have a dramatic theatrical light, a spotlight effect, it focuses your eye, it focuses, it focuses your energy, it wants you to see certain parts in a way that a gentle sfumato or even a chiaroscuro with an external or internal light source can't do. So this tenebrous lighting, um, really begun by Caravaggio uh, in Rome and his work in Naples now, extends all throughout uh, Western Europe. 
And so Paolo Finolio was one of these artists who um, takes the tenebrous light, incorporates it usually to biblical subjects such as Joseph and Potiphar's wife, um, and has that same Baroque feel of realism and proportion, but then adds this heightened drama with, kit with uh, curtains and animated gestures and um, seduction in this case. And then here you see, um, that's my son, he's 6'1", so you can um, get a sense of uh, the proportion. And also, where it is, it, it, obviously it belongs in, in a, um, it was actually in a private collection. This was a, a huge piece for a palace, um, never in a church. But now, of course, it's in um, Harvard's uh, art museums, a beautiful Renzo Piano building, and you can kind of see it through the um, wonderfully Italianate arcade there. So that's where it lives today. And then, of course, we must talk about Caravaggio. Um, and so, to conclude with a paper, uh, any kind of conversation about um, artist perception or audience perception and artist techniques, um, Caravaggio is, is the master of the Baroque. Um, here you see his calling of St. Matthew, and it incorporates just about everything I've talked about here, um, except probably linear perspective. He knew linear perspective and he used it, so we do have a sense of foreground, middle ground, and background, but then he does everything else, from foreshortening to a tenebrous light source from the upper right um, side to chiaroscuro and, and directing our attention directly at um, St. Matthew, who basically says, who me, as he's called. And he also incorporates the gestures of previous artists. Um, if you're seeing um, the creation of Adam um, reach from Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel ceiling in the, in the gesture of Christ, that is correct. Um, and then, of course, also any kind of blurring of the background where it's very difficult to see the differentiation between the background and the silhouette of the figure. There's your sfumato. So if the, uh, the conference that we're all participating here, Art Seeking Understanding, um, I'm asking you to seek understanding art uh, through Italian Renaissance and Baroque techniques, and I hope that I have helped in the shaping of the audience perception. Thank you. Um, join me again in thanking Dr. Hornick for that presentation. If you have a question, I'll raise your hand. I'll bring this microphone to you, and I'll leave this one for her to answer. So if you have questions, if, just raise your hand, and I'll, I'll make my way to you. Not everyone all at once, please. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, I guess I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, or your case for how important it is for art students to learn these techniques in painting, and maybe just, just that, and maybe how old, and or up to what level, et cetera. Sure, um, so let's start with Baylor's program. Um, part of the reason I've stayed at Baylor's program so long as an art historian, where most of you know art history can be in a whole separate department and sometimes even a separate college away from the artists, is that we teach what we would call the same approach as the Academia del Diseño. The, the idea that first you draw, then everything else. So that's the same, that, that Academia del Diseño was founded in Florence in 1563 and just kept going. And those are, many of my artists, I remind them of that, um, that that's what we're doing. So I would say courses in drawing one, drawing two, figure one, figure two, 2D design, 3D design, all before you pick up a paintbrush is pretty cool. Um, so that, that, that basis will always be with them. And our graphic designers do it too, as do our photographers and our ceramists and our fiber artists. So it really is a, a foundational um, belief that we have and I share. In terms of young people, um, I think 
young people need to expand all the arts to find the one they really, really love, whether it's music, theater, dance, um, or visual art. So I'd say, in that sense, um, we need more of that in our curricular. You know, I've raised two sons. One was a musician um, and tried also a little bit of art. Um, the other one, not so much. Um, but I think it was offered to them here, you know, through the various um, uh, levels of education. So that's the short answer to that. So. Other questions? May I just ask, how many people have seen um, the pictures in Rome? Most of you, good. And how about the pictures in Florence? Excellent, and Paris, the Louvre? Okay, so I brought back a lot of old friends today. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Hornick. You mentioned at one point the kind of iconic features that these, these images have, but they're different from what people would typically think of as an icon. And so I'm curious, when, when, I, when I've heard, we had Dr. Begbie here this morning, and you can hear in music maybe words working together with sound, the, the technique of, of the musician to create a kind of theological effect or something. I'm just wondering if we have any artists self-reflecting on how they were employing the techniques towards theological kind of perceptual ends. Yes, I think each of these artists that I've shown, um, I mean, again, you have to think about what the culture was. Um, 15th century, 16th century, probably every one of these artists is uh, attending mass, is hearing scripture, if not daily, at least three to five times a week. Um, they're hearing sermons three to five times a week. So it's, it's, it's instinctual, I think, in many cases for Italian artists um, as, they, as they create. Um, and that influence, I think, if you understand this level, then you can apply the theological, iconographical attributes. Um, and it's interesting, because teaching art history to, I'd say still most of our students have a very strong Judeo-Christian background. Um, they do not know that Mary Magdalene is a conflation of three traditions and that she has long red hair and it's flowing um, because she is perhaps um, a prostitute. But that's her iconographic symbols and theological bent for why she leans across the foot of the cross. Um, so those are the kind of things that we then battle with and struggle with. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Others? Along those lines, on, a, on perhaps speaking from your own personal level, do you find that the humanist traditions and the humanist ideas, do they add to the theological implications of some of these iconographic elements, or do you feel like they actually, because uh, I think of the times there are people who are arguing that it takes away. No, and, and I think, let me, if, you, if you will let me do this just for a couple minutes, probably the, the best answer to your question is with Masaccio's Trinity. So I use this as an example of a very formalist approach. I told you about orthogonals, I told you about linear perspective, I ta told you about science. But if you look at this carefully, what you have are four levels, four theological levels to unpack. Um, the top level is the spiritual level, of course, with the Trinity. You see God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. Then the next level is the saintly level, where Mary, the mother, um, is seen on the favored side of Christ, on the right side. And of course, St. John, the beloved, um, on the left side. Then the next level are the patrons. So the patrons, again, audience perception, this is their tomb. The audience is participating in this theological program, correctly perspected, on the wall of this church. And so Senor Lenzi on the right, again, the male on the favored side, and his wife, Senora Lenzi, on the left. And then maybe mo the most interesting thing, I think, is that this is the first anatomical anatomically drawn and painted skeleton that we know of. And the inscription, I know you can't see it, but it says in Latin, what you are, I once was, what I am, you will become. It doesn't get much more intentional for a, a tomb sculpture than this kind, these kinds of levels of presence, as well as scriptural and um, non-canonical references to death. <laughs> 
can I ask a follow-up then? Sure. So some people trace uh, what many would uh, condemn in modernism and sort of the self-focus mm -hmm. as rooted in especially, I would say, going as far back as Giotto and, and what he's doing. Do you, do you push back against that? Would you say that there's a place in Renaissance or Baroque where they achieve the pinnacle and shouldn't have gone beyond that? Or is <laughs> modernism actually not something we should condemn? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will not condemn modernism if I want to keep my job with my 14 studio art colleagues, um, but as contemporary artists. But I do think in terms of the history of art, um, I think humanism never leaves. Um, I think any one of the contemporary artists of today, um, if no matter how individualistic their works may seem, no, how many, no, how, no matter how much political statement they may be making, it comes from their insides, their humanism, their ability to create as God's most beautiful creature, create, and most um, intelligent creator. And so I think that really takes precedence um, than perhaps the negativity that so often we see um, anti-theological, let's say, um, in, con in contemporary art. But it, it is very different. You know, I'm doing, a sur I'm doing survey now. I teach less now that I'm chair, so I pick my classes carefully. But I'm teaching 1400 to the present now. And we're in realism and impressionism. And we haven't seen Jesus in about two weeks, you know. But we had six weeks of Jesus when we did 1400 to 1700. So that in itself is an adjustment for them, you know. And it's a natural adjustment, I think, because of the, um, the, the history of art but I keep trying to bring them back and bring contemporary artists back. And I know Mako was here. So, you know, those kinds of people reemerge in the first week of December when we do contemporary art and they, and they, they see Jesus again. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Another question? Thank you, Dr. Hornick. Thank you. Sarah Wade. Um, there we go. Our second presentation today is by Dr. Natalie Carnes. Dr. Carnes is a constructive theologian who reflects on traditional theological topics through somewhat less traditional themes, like images, iconoclasm, beauty, gender, and childhood. She received her AB from Harvard University, an MA from the University of Chicago, and a PhD from Duke University, before beginning her career at Baylor, where she is an associate professor of theology in the religion department. In addition to authoring articles for in Modern Theology, Journal of Religion, and Scottish Journal of Theology, Dr. Carnes has published three books. Beauty, a Theological Engagement with Gregory of Nyssa, Image and Presence, a Christological Reflection on Iconoclasm and Icon Iconophilia, and the most recent entitled Motherhood, a Confession, which mirrors the structure and themes of Augustine's confessions to offer a different story that reflects on different flesh as to consider what it means to be human in the face of the divine. Currently, she is working on several projects, but I'll mention only one, which is co-authored with Matthew Whelan that explores intersections of poverty, aesthetics, luxury, and art, in which they're trying to answer the question, what is the place of art in a world of poverty and suffering? Her presentation today is titled, Bearing Witness, Rhymes in Christian Art and Asceticism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carnes. Thank you so much, Dr. McMichael. Thank you also, Dr. Hornick, for that just really fascinating presentation. I love a presentation with images. I have just one for you. It's this one. Thanks also to Dr. Jeffrey for inviting me and for all of you for braving the rain to be here. Begin with the apostle. He wrote, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly crucified. 
Paul is in this third chapter admonishing the Galatians, scolding them for betraying the gospel after they have themselves witnessed Christ crucified. But what can he mean? Jesus was not crucified in Galatia. The Galatians didn't caravan en masse to Jerusalem for Christ's death. Likely no one reading Paul's letter ever met Jesus of Nazareth, much less did they see him before their eyes at Golgotha. They did, however, see Paul, who claims a few verses prior he has been crucified with Christ. Therefore, Paul can say that God reveals God's own son, en amoy, a phrase that could translate as to me or in me or both. Revealing Christ to Paul and in Paul, God also publicly reveals Christ crucified to the Galatians by Paul. The apostle in this way establishes his authority as a messenger of the gospel by reminding the Galatians of his intimacy both with them and with Christ. With maternal force, Paul rebukes, cajoles, and encourages the church in Galatia not to give up his gospel, then offers his summary plea. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I carry the marks stigmata of Jesus branded on my body. He pivots to a brief blessing and concludes the letter. The Christic marks on Paul's body become available and new to the church in Galatia and beyond by Paul's letter, which draws a verbal portrait of Paul bearing the cross of Christ. As the marked Paul mediates Christ, so too does the Galatian letter. One stigmatized mediation generates another. Through these linked images, Paul articulates a logic that will ultimately connect the ascetic and the artist. So leaving to the side, for this presentation at least, what connection of artist and saint survive into modernity, that question of modernism again, I restrict myself to suggesting how ascetic saints galvanize artistic representation of their asceticism and, those, and how those representations themselves imitate the saint's imitation and also how artistic representations intend to inspire and prepare a person for an ascetic life of mercy. As we piece together some key moments in that history, we follow the stigmata of Christ, famously claimed by Paul and associated with St. Francis of Assisi, that strange and compelling figure who eschewed earthly possessions and inspired visual sumptuousness. My life, Francis intimated, is a painting. Shortly after his death, Francis's imitation, like the saint's Christly imitation, is quite literally realized as he becomes one of the most popular subjects in Italian art. The artists and patrons who represented Francis illustrate a theme in Christian history. Like other Christian artists of antiquity in the Middle Ages, they tapped into a logic of image making deep in the traditions of Christian asceticism, the logic of witness. In an icon of Bonaventura Berlingeri, this is the one, made just 10 years after Francis' death, the saint fills the length of the pentagonal panel. Against the gold leaf background, his figure cuts a stark silhouette. His long, dark robe covers his body, the hood framing even his face like an inverse nimbus. Except for his face, the only visible parts of his body are his hands and feet, the sights of his stigmata. Represented as stylized, uniform black circles, four wounds are visible, visually accentuated even by the strong color contrast with the gold of the background and the tan of Francis's body. But where is the fifth? The largest and most controversial stigma, the side wound, is covered by his dark robe. Marking its location is a beautiful jeweled book, conveying the significance of what we cannot see. In place of the stigma, the book is offered to the beholder. One irony of this painting is that Francis himself was famously ambivalent about books. Books in the 13th century were highly expensive, and the 1220 annual chapters of the emerging Franciscan order explicitly forbid the brothers from, from possessing them. The theologian and early Franciscan brother Bonaventure reports a story of, of Francis taking apart the binding of the New Testament so that several brothers could, could share it and read it at the same time. The ornamented bound book that Francis holds here in Berlingeri's panel seems at one level a betrayal of the saint's commitment to Christ-like poverty. But if it is a betrayal, it is not just so in the sense of its unfaithfulness, but also in its showing forth. For the four uniform wounds that do not look like wounds, together with a book that is not a wound at all, evoke Francis's wounds by setting up a contrast. The highly ornamented book and the stylized wounds underscore their artifice, 
pointing back to Francis with his God-given miraculous stigmata as an image of God not made with human hands. The Berlingeri image displays its own distance from the event of Francis's stigmatization in order to mediate his stigmata more powerfully. Around the central stigmatized image of Francis are six smaller images, scenes from the life and posthumous life of Francis that include his receiving of the stigmata. The style of painting is the Vita icon, a relatively new technology during the Duecento, but the technology within it, the book, is much older, and the written word, older still. Six years before Berlingeri pa paints the first panel of the stigmatized saint, Thomas of Solano writes the first life of Francis, hinting at without fully revealing the stigmata, which will become more fully described in his second life of 1246. And around 1,200 years before that stigmatized life, Paul is presenting his own in a logic that subsequently shapes Christianity. At the very heart of the developing early Christian literary culture, Margaret Mitchell writes, is the phenomenon of the epiphany, a mediated manifestation of a deity. In an article that traces epiphany throughout the New Testament, Mitchell begins her analysis of what she calls the epiphanic evolutions in Paul. The letter to the Galatians is an epiphany of two linked mediations, the letter and Paul, by which Christ is mediated to the church in Galatia. The letter is not unique in Paul's corpus. In an epistle to the Corinthians, the epiphany registers in an olfactory image. Paul claims that God manifests the scent of knowing Christ in them, the Corinthians, for they are the aroma of Christ to God. Here it is not just Paul who smells of Christ, so does the Corinthian church, so that the epiphany is corporate, not just individual. Paul then transposes the language of epiphany into a visual key, declaring that the Corinthians carry in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be visible in our bodies. It's 410. According to Paul, Jesus is both visible and odorous in the bodies of the Corinthians. By them, as by him, Christ can be perceived. Paul's textual epiphany lodges itself firmly into Christian storytelling and thought. His strategy of describing Christ as the image of God and himself as the imitator of Christ develops a chain of mediations that structures Christian understanding of witness and cultivates a particular religious sensibility. What Paul inaugurated, Mitchell argues, was nothing short of a media revolution in which readers across space and time could encounter divine presence for themselves. We see the legacy of Paul's media revolution in the Gospels, uh, which I won't go into here, but also in early Christian martyrologies and hagiographies. Writing in the early second century, Ignatius extended Paul's chains of mediations by articulating the Eucharist within it. So some of you might have read the martyrdom of Polycarp, where he extends Paul's aromatic imagery, describing Polycarp's burned, martyred flesh as smelling sweet and appearing like bread. The bread, of course, of Christ's Eucharistic presence. In the text, Polycarp also refuses, like Christ, to flee his persecutors and prays that God's will be done. His betrayers, like Judas, were thought to be friends. The police captain, eager to hand him over, is named Herod. As Polycarp imitates Christ, so does his martyrdom text mirrors Christ's passion text. In this way, it is representative of the martyrology genre. In her book on, on, on early Christian martyrs as other Christs, Canada de Moss traces multiple features of the Gospels that appear throughout the Acts of the Martyrs. Various allusions to cruciformity, the martyr committing his spirit to the Lord, the flow of the blood and the water, and the conversion of a military bystander. The martyrdom texts imitate the Gospels, styling themselves as epiphanies of divine presence similar to those sacred texts. And then when the age of the martyrs comes to an end, ascetics are increasingly described as imitators of Christ, explicitly linked to the martyr through, for example, Cyprian's description of asceticism as white martyrdom, and Pope Gregory's description of it as hidden martyrdom and secret martyrdom. And as the acts of the martyrs witness to Christ, so did a new genre develop to mediate the witness of these ascetics. From the mid-fourth century, in the midst of the ascetic revolutions of late antiquity, Christian writers represented holy people through the genre of hagiography. Derek Kruger argues that the lives of hagiography, like the written lives, are not only records of this ascetic revolution, they are also ascetic performances in their own right, in which writing becomes a means of ascetic transformation. 
In the form of writing, the author models the humility and obedience of the saint that he describes, which is ultimately the humility and obedience of Christ, whom the saint imitates. The writer performs this asceticism in several ways, often through effacing himself as the author and denigrating his style. Kruger describes these stylistic choices as the ritual humiliation of the text, in which these written lives bear the marks of the author's own ascesis. As a site in which the author performs a kind of asceticism, the text becomes a humiliated extension of the author's own body, an imitation of the saint who imitates Christ. In this way, it too mediates Christ, partaking of the logic of epiphany. As Kruger writes, mortified, stigmatized by its own inadequacy, the text suffers humiliation in order to save. And the text saves by becoming an image of the one who saves. The ascetic body, like the martyr's body, like the ecclesial body, like the Paul the Apostle's body, witnesses to Christ in a powerful way that pressures new forms of representation. And these artistic representations inspire and prepare new acts of asceticism. One stigmatized corpus generates another. Visual art no less than literary emerged in this logic of witness. In his encomium on St. Theodore, Gregory of Nyssa writes of the, the martyr's relics as making the martyr vividly perceptible to the beholder, evoking her tears and directing her prayers so that the Holy One is present in a new way. The veneration of such precious relics generates reliquaries decorated with images, and these images repeat the relic's act of making present. The veneration of relics and images are bound together in this logic of witness. One of the great defenders of icons during the Byzantine iconoclast controversy was Theodore of Studios, who claimed the body of Christ or the saint was available to the viewer of the icon by imitation. The icon for Theodore serves as an eyewitness to Christ and so extends the witness of Christ, just like martyrs do, just like relics do. If such witness is not possible, Theodore asks, then what use is the body of the martyr, which is the imitation of that which is heavenly? The icon is, like the body of the martyr, an imitation of Christ, though in the medium of wood and paint rather than flesh and blood. The icon thus affirms as a sensible fact what our mind has assented to by faith. In Theodore's words, the imaginary is completed by becoming visible in the enacted form of an icon. As a martyr makes present Christ crucified, as an ascetic does the same, so an icon makes Christ perceptible to us. In so doing, the icon renders us witnesses. The Iconodil Nicophorus describes the icon as providing an eyewitness account in order to inspire us to imitate that event or person, to, in a way, inhabit our imaginations that we might re-perform it. So it's a chain of ascesis. To gaze at an icon of a holy person is to perceive the holiness of Christ and oneself potentially be transformed into a holier person. An icon can perform this mediation and avoid idolatry because it performs its own ascetic renunciation by the type of aesthetic object that it is. The icon's asceticism directs the perceiver through its material existence to the divine presence that is not reducible to that existence. It negates itself to mediate that which is beyond itself. The intimacy of icon of Christ and Christ is so strong as Theodore describes it, that the honor given to the icon passes through to the one depicted. In this way, its asceticism imitates the asceticism of the word made flesh. Christ makes God present on earth as an image, the image of the invisible God, and images of Christ also make Christ present on earth, though they bear a different kind of divine presence. These images can point to Christ because of their own renunciations, the way they direct the gaze beyond themselves. In this way, Icons are as much ascetic objects as hagiographic texts are, and they imitate Christ by resisting the temptation to seize power and attention for themselves. For centuries, Byzantine icons like the one Theodore and the other iconoduls defended dominated visual art in Christianity, but new forms of visual imaging developed, and they began accelerating in the Middle Ages, and particularly accelerated in interesting ways with the advent of Francis. Bonaventure describes the stigmatization of Francis by invoking a powerful biblical precedent. Francis came down the mountain, he writes, bearing with him the likeness of the crucified depicted not on tablets of stone or on panels of wood carved by hand, 
but engraved on parts of his flesh, the finger of the living God. So Bonaventure is alluding here to Moses' descent down Sinai as Moses carries tablets engraved by the finger of God. These achiropoietic tablets made without human hands contrast with the idol Moses will find at the foot of the mountain where the people of God dance around a golden calf cast by Aaron in Moses' absence. In Bonaventure's telling, Francis' body also carries an achiropoietic engraving. He is an image of the crucified, one that Bonaventure elevates above both human-made artifacts like the golden calf and above even the tablets of stone that Moses carries. For Francis is a divine image made in flesh, a living image engraved by the living God. God has made him a vital image of the crucified, art that breathes. In the fourth century, as hagiography was emerging as a genre and ascetic programs transforming spirituality, Basil of Caesarea compares the Christian pursuing sanctification to a painter who carefully observes a model to imitate its characteristics in her art. In the same way, the Christian turns her eyes to the saints as though to living and moving statues, he says, to carve in her life replica statues as a sculptor works on stone. 800 years later, Francis has become a living statue of the crucified. Here is a saint for Christians to model their own replica statues on. But by the time Bonaventure writes his, his life of Francis, Francis is dead. How can a person keep her eyes turned to Francis, as Basil exhorts us, when the saint is no longer present among us? As he writes the life of Francis, Bonaventure is thinking about this question of representation. Before his stigmatization account, he reports an episode in which Francis is asked what he thinks about his friars studying. The saint replies, according to Bonaventure, that he is happy with the brother studying as long as he prays more than he reads. Good little mantra to keep with you, pray more than you study. You can tell your professor that as an excuse for why you haven't finished your reading. You just had so much praying. So following the example of Christ, of whom we read that he prayed more than he read, we should also pray more than we read. So to, to imitate Christ is to pray, but to know how to imitate Christ, to observe Christ, involves reading. We need art to direct us, to energize us to asceticism. And what of Francis? How do we know how to imitate Francis? How do we know, as William Cook says, that Francis is uniquely bore Christ's wounds on his body, that his flesh was transformed by the finger of the living God? Well, Bonaventure has just provided one answer. We know it because we read about it, and we read about it in his telling of Francis's life or in Thomas of Solano's telling. Of course, that's not the only way. We also have images. And Cook writes, we can also see the wounds of Christ on Francis because Francis is stigmatized image on a painted wood of panel, a, a painted panel of wood. So we are able to experience Francis through an image on wood the way that Francis experienced Christ on the cross through an image on wood at San Damiano. So in other words, the visual representation of Francis's wounds is a particularly fitting way to communicate them because it echoes the way Francis first received these wounds through an image. The way an image can mediate Christ, can witness to Christ, is intrinsic to Francis's own story of conversion and rebirth into Christ. And the evidence of this rebirth is astonishingly visible on Francis's very body as the stigmata. To perceive Francis is better than to perceive a panel of Francis, and to see Christ is better than to see Francis. But divine presence can still be authentically and transformatively encountered in these mediations. The San Damiano crucifix, a relatively new version of the cross the time Francis encounters it and is transformed, is evidence of this. In Thomas of Solano's telling, Francis is kneeling before the crucifix in the ruins of the church of San Damiano when the image speaks to him. With the lips of the painting, the image of Christ says, Francis, go rebuild my house. As you can see, it is being destroyed. Thomas describes the event's impact on Francis. From that time on, compassion for the crucified was impressed into his holy soul, he says. And we honestly believe the wounds of the sacred passion were impressed deep in his heart though not yet on his flesh. Later, Francis will receive the wounds in his flesh, the famous stigmata, and those wounds, his companions write in another telling of the story, are renewals of the earlier heart wounds he received at San Damiano. By the San Damiano crucifix, Francis reads words from Christ himself, and in that encounter, his own transformation into an image begins. 
after Francis has transformed into that image, after he has died and is no longer available to the human gaze, Franciscans influenced by him begin to provoke transformations and artistic representations of Christ. Before Francis, the crucified Christ was depicted pri primarily triumphantly. He was the triumphing Christ. But after Francis, images of the suffering Christ uh, become more popular and begin to eclipse that earlier depiction of the triumphing Christ. They lay claim to these um, suffering Christ images, lay claim to the emotions of the viewer, quickening an affective piety that becomes central to the Franciscan order. Depictions of Francis also change art forms. The difficulty of representing Francis and his own imaging of Christ generates some of the first Vita icons, the Berlin Gary panel, a form that becomes popular for betraying Francis and later other saints as well, like Mary Magdalene, Margaret of Cortona, and Claire of Assisi. The life of Francis, the way it mediates Christ, its peculiar tensions of visibility and concealment generates and elevates new forms of visual culture. And Francis's wounds are intimate with his repair of the church through a life of poverty, a solidarity with those the gospel calls the least of these. More than simply an ascetic tactic, poverty for Francis is, in the words of Xavier Soubert, the very choreography of Francis's union with Christ. As Francis's wounds express God's love for us and Christ's mediating role between earth and heaven, so too does Francis's stigmatized body testify to the love that bridges earth and heaven. Through poverty, he receives the marks of the God who became poor, and through his poverty, his life becomes a gift that can fulfill the injunction at San Damiano, rebuild my church. Through such poverty, St. Francis embraces deeply the literal sense, which then opens for him to the spiritual precisely by way of his intense commitment to the literal. Francis' journey begins in, in some ways with this speaking image at San Damiano, when his heart was wounded with stigmata that God would later carve on his flesh. After his death, his story continues in images and texts that witness to Francis' life in forms Francis himself could not have anticipated and possibly would not have condoned. But artistic forms were pressured by the centrality of, of witness within Christianity. In the wake of Francis, the Franciscans found the Vita icon a, more, a form congenial to witnessing to Francis and to Francis' witness to Christ, more so than the traditional icon. The way the Vita icon includes multiple narrative scenes that allow for complex presentation of identity and Christly presence helped elucidate Francis' unique witness and confirm the saint's rep reputation as an altar Christus. Unlike the traditional icon in which the viewer gazes at a single scene, the Vita icon interrupts the viewer's gaze, adverting to the partial access the viewer has to Francis's life, continuing to communicate and teach the dynamics of revelation and concealment that characterizes Francis's own imitation of Christ. The rise of Franciscan art in this way continues the legacy of witnessing to Christ that characterizes artistic history we have traced from Paul's letters through the age of the martyrs with their acts and the hagiographies of late antiquity. What these martyrs, ascetics, saints, writers, and artists attempt to present is Christ, or a person who images Christ, for the purposes of staging a divine encounter that inspires the beholder, listener, or reader to herself become an image of Christ through an ascetic transformation. While it seems impossibly incongruous that the saint who owned nothing, remained famously ambivalent about books, and aspired to absolute poverty, spawned some of the most visually lavish paintings of the 13th century, these two aspects of the saint's legacy, the poverty and the art, are not only incongruous, or are not merely incongruous, they are each sustained by the same logic of image and presence. By the lips of the image, St. Francis received Christ's message, rebuild my house. Francis first attempts a literal repair, rebuilding the church of San Damiano from dilapidation. Then realizing what seems a misunderstanding, he embarks on a vocation indebted to a more allegorical interpretation of the command, repairing the Catholic church with his witness of the poverty of Christ. Sometimes Francis's first response is understood as a, as a mistake he learned to correct, a false interpretation of the command. But are his two interpretations so disjunctive is it like Francis, whose imitation of Christ was so breathtakingly literal, to see a literal interpretation of Christ's words as a mistake? And is it like the one who just received the words of Christ from the mouth of an ecclesial artwork to repudiate the importance of liturgical objects? Perhaps instead of there being two competing interpretations, one literal and wrong, the other spiritual and right, the words of Christ bear both interpretations, the literal opening to the spiritual, such that the material repair of the church 
helps witness to, energize, and inspire its spiritual repair. In the end, Francis rebuilds the church by beginning with his repair of the ruined building, a literal interpretation, which prepares him for the spiritual rebuilding, a spiritual interpretation of the command, which accomplishes his commitment to poverty, a literal interpretation of the imitation of Christ. The witness of art, the building, the image, and the witness of Francis's ascetic brotherhood and sisterhood through Claire are ordered together rather than against one another. Art can prepare for, inspire, and render the beauty of asceticism as the ascetic also renders herself a compellingly perceptible figure of Christ. That's not to say that the witness of art and asceticism always rhymes, nor that the literal and spiritual interpretations of rebuilding Christ's church sit easily together. The Basilica in Assisi, meant to honor the legacy of Francis shortly after his death, was seen by some Franciscans to be a betrayal of it. The controversy over building that church reminds us that art and asceticism, even when ordered to the same end, often come to us knotted in complex and competitive relations. They require careful negotiations. Art can distract us, can attract our energies and resources away from asceticism. And yet art can also bear witness to Christ, not as a distant object, but as present within the act of witnessing. And in this way, both artist and ascetic bear Christ to new peoples, places, and times, testifying to Christ's aliveness in the world. We saw this logic of witness germinate in the letters of Paul, grow in early Christian hagiography as the texts are mortified and the author disclaims his abilities, and then flower in Franciscan art, like the Berlingeri panel, which exaggerates the artificiality of Francis's wounds to disavow its status as Francis, and in that way, point more emphatically to Francis as one greater than any artistic representation. Energized by commitment to Christ crucified and resurrected, the wounded one who yet lives among us, both art and asceticism are stigmatized by a constraint born into excess. The object decreases so that the subject might increase. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Carnes. Questions for Dr. Carnes? Dr. Carnes, thank you so much for a really rich, wonderful paper. Um, you've helped me understand a episode from Dante's Purgatory, and that's the first terrace of pride where Dante views the, the penitential uh, pilgrims bent over, right, under, under a great stone. And he compares them to what I think is called a caryatid. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but the, or the corbel or something. Like the, the figures that would hold up a build that appeared to be holding up a, a building. Maybe Dr. Hornick could, could correct me. Okay, thank you. And um, so we expect him to compare the, the, the pilgrims to the, is it the caryatid or the corbel? The caryatid. We expect him to compare the, the figures, the penitents, to the caryatid. Um, but he doesn't. He compares them to the person viewing the caryatid. And I find that fascinating, and it was always puzzling to me, but uh, you know, a near contemporary of the, of the, the movement that you're, that you're describing here with the Franciscan art. So it, 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 I, I wonder, it's just a, yeah, it helps me understand, and I, I suspect that it is drawing from the same tradition. Uh, so uh, yeah, this I guess is an attempt to move this towards the, to my, to my field, the literary, uh, and also the rhetorical, I guess it's from the rhetorical tradition that I've understood that before. And so now I, I, I see that's kind of an impoverished <laughs> tradition. Um, but there is a connection, and I'll just offer this as, as a connection and then try to put it in the form of a question. And that's this, if we go back to Paul, when he says he puts the, you know, put Christ before the eyes of, of the Galatians, um, it's probable that, he's, that, the, that the word there is pro omaton pone, which was utterly conventional in the rhetorical tradition for making somebody, you know, tell, it was a kind of narration to tell something as if they were there to, to see it. Anargea is the classical term. So I um, invite your, your, your um, connection between say the preaching of the word, 
in that rhetorical context to the visual um, kind of asceticism that, that, that is here? What, what connections might we draw to draw these two, two traditions and practices uh, more close? Thank you, Dr. Weaver, for those rich reflections. I mean, I think it's right there in that word energeia, which is also a word used to describe the, the vitality, the aliveness of icons and the ways that they work on the beholder. And um, yeah, so there's been some, some work recently pushing back on all of these theologians who are like writing about icons and overly theologizing them and are less attentive to the fact that actually not all icons seem to work or work in the same way, that we haven't paid enough attention to the actual aesthetics of icons and the difference in quality. And um, with that, I mean, uh, Cornelia Saccharito is one who has made this argument. And with that, that um, the way that particular aesthetic techniques make for this more vivid quality of presence, this, and, it, and, and that word is energeia, the kind of energy or aliveness such that the, the icon bears this presence to us. And so I would, I would think that the, that the same kind of energeia that describes a rhetoric that's working on the beholder um, is the same that's described with this working on the visual. I mean, I think what's interesting with the, the rhetoric is that it's, the image is completed in your imagination in some way. You as the, as the, as the audience are sort of building that image. Whereas if you're gazing at, the, at an image that's there, um, the, it's, it's, a, it's a different phenomenological experience. I don't know exactly how I would try to describe the difference, but the difference between building the image and then receiving the image as, as if coming forth, as if bearing presence that's already sort of built for you, that seems to be like an interesting difference between rhetoric and visual art. Other questions? And then of course there's all those like scientific studies that not all people are equally image makers in their, with their imaginations. That some people read books and don't form mental images and some people form really detailed ones. So I don't know what to do with all of that, but there's, there's something really rich there that I think could be unpacked either humanistically or in conversation with the psychological sciences. Hi, Dr. Carnes. Hi, Nathaniel. Loved, <laughs> loved the lecture. Um, I was reminded of uh, the book that we read in your Intro to Theology class uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, Tokens of Trust mm -hmm. um, by Rowan Williams. Uh, and the broader theme, to give a very rough summary of it, was that um, we learn about the faith or our faith is strengthened by looking at the lives of the saints that have gone before us. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking that a lot of what you're saying is kind of parsing out, um, for lack of better term, the theological mechanics of uh, how that works. I mean, just how like the, you were talking about Paul and the martyrs and how the life of Jesus is made visible in our bodies. So do you see a connection between um, the work that you are now doing and kind of like what Rowan, Rowan Williams was saying and how you, would this be like a type of argument or uh, not necessarily an argument, but like a witness to how art is almost necessary to the testimony mm -hmm. of the saints for the strengthening of our faith? Yes, Rowan Williams, um, he, He's quoting, um, he quotes Ambrose when he says, it does not befit God to save people by arguments, that instead he saves people by lives and by the witness of lives, which is then why I made you all read all of those um, hagiographies of saints and do presentations on them. Um, and um, yeah, I think the thing is, Christianity is not um, a religion that's about, um, that's about a kind of series of like a sense to a series of propositions. It's about uh, encounter. It's about encountering the risen Christ. And so, how do you how do you encounter the risen Christ? Well, you encounter the risen Christ because Christ has become 
available to you, perceptible to you in some way? And how, what more powerful way is there other than uh, the lives of, of the saints in which Christ is, continues to see the resurrected Christ alive in their lives? And then also to these perceptible objects that point us back to Christ and to the witness of those who have lived a life sur surrendered to Christ. Um, so I do, I do think that this gets at something about what Christianity fundamentally is and also about what, what faith is and the way that faith is different from, um, from a kind of calculation or different from a kind of like cognitive ascent but involves this kind of transformative um, giving of trust and in, in, in Rowan Williams' words that it's a relationship of uh, of trust rather than of cognitive ascent. And, and I think that that points to a particular role for um, art, which works on us in multiple ways, right? Not, not just by showing us something, but also by working on our, 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 our uh, working on us affectively um, and by making things vivid to us. Um, yeah. Thanks for that, it was a great lecture uh, to echo what's already been said. Um, a question on the, uh, if we can imitate art and saints in art, is there any danger of misrepresentation or the, or the deformative ways that saints are pictured or what they can do? And I'm thinking of Matthew Milner has this kind of article on iconoclasm of like God being picturing God with a gray beard and what that how that deforms us and so I'm just thinking about that that opposite side anything that you would add there yeah I think depictions of God the Father is a great example because in the council that was on images and iconoclasm they were like but there's no depicting God the Father why because you don't depict the divine nature. When you depict Christ, you de so um, you depict the second person of the Trinity, and what is visible, you see the stuff that you see is human nature. So the divine nature is visible through the human nature of Christ, but divine nature itself remains invisible, right? So the way this whole tradition developed is like there's this loophole because you can't depict God the Father who is incorporeal. But you can, like, like, just like you can symbolically depict the Holy Spirit as a dove, you can symbolically depict the God the Father as the Ancient of Days. And so you have this tradition of depicting God the Father symbolically as the Ancient of Days. But then when you get a series, like an artistic tradition, woo, where um, you get the Ancient of Days right next to Jesus of Nazareth, then it looks like they're being depicted in the same register, right? Whereas one is an image and the other is a symbol, but when you just see them there together, it looks like they're both images, right? So it looks like, well, who God the Father is, is an old white man with a beard. And that does deform our imaginations. Now, what's, what's the response to that? Is it like, well, let's go and like excise like all these sort of like pictures of God the Father? Or like clearly that doesn't seem to be um, the way to go. I mean, among other ways, that there, there is a way of interpreting what's happening as theologically legitimate if terribly misleading, right? So I think that the answer is that we, we need other ways of, we, we need to, ref, to introduce more ways of imaging um, that recapture the uninvisibility of God the Father and new ways of speaking about God the Father that also do that. And I think, you know, one thing I always challenge my students to do in my classes is to try to not speak about God in pronouns using he just as an anti-idolatry exercise to see if you can do it. Whether you want to go pronounless or use she, just try it. It makes you feel uncomfortable, but it's a way of reminding us, well, God is not literally a he. God is, the father is not literally the white man with the beard. And so how can we um, sort of purge our imaginations of these um, images that are not necessarily bad in themselves, right? The Ancient of Days could be a good way to depict God, but have become so settled and sedimented in our cultural depictions of God that they've become dangerous to us. I so like I have a, maybe a tangent question, but a lot of womanist scholars, when they're looking at iconography or looking at witness, have actually shifted what is the mark of Christ. And so I'm kind of curious in this context, you know, you're talking about a really particular tradition 
Mm -hmm. But womanist scholars kind of shift it to more that Christ's mark is to bring forth life out of death. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they switch to other stories or that Christ is, um, it's not death that's embraced or the marks of wounds that are embraced, uh -huh. but actually life that's embraced. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious because we're talking about the formation of the, of the Christian imagination. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think one of the sort of <clears throat> beautiful images um, that embodies some of this womanist insights is the, uh, the Mark Duke's interpretation of um, Our Lady Mother of Ferguson and all of those victims of gun violence. But what's interesting is that it doesn't, about that image, it's, um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's Mary and holding, and it, it's, it's an interpretation of the version of the sign icon, which is like where you have Jesus in the womb of Mary praying for the world. Um, and you, you can sort of see that Jesus praying is opened through a sort of circle of where Mary's womb would be. Um, and in the image that Mark Dukes um, uh, writes in the, his icon, it's the Jesus's hands are in a posture ambiguous, whether it's prayer or hands up, don't shoot. And there's the sights of a gun that are transformed on him that are, but also his um, sacred heart uh, is in the sights of the gun with with thorns encircling. And so what I think is powerful about this image is that it doesn't shy away from the realities of death. As I think most womanist theologians want us to acknowledge that black life is saturated with the threats of death all around it, that um, death conditions in some ways, um, the kind of names the cultural conditions of black life in this world. And yet, at the same time, that heart remains um, you know that the sights of the gun tell you that the baby is about to be shot, and in fact that you are looking through the sights of the gun. And yet the, the gold triumph of the nimbus, the sacred heart, also tell you that the gun is not the end of the story there. And so I find that a particularly compelling womanist adjacent portrait because it acknowledges the conditions of death while also uh, naming the hope that survives even, even that death. Oh, hey, Fanny. Hey. Thank you so much for that and um, uh, the talk. And it, it really um, brought to my attention a new thing that I really haven't thought about, this idea of an icon as a, a, a martyred object, an, an ascetic object. And um, I'll try to, it's, it's an observation that I'm trying to turn into a question right now. And it's that um, there's this uh, kernel of wheat dying in, you know, into the ground. Unless that happens, life can't come. So in the Christian tra tradition, there's this, um, the crucified Christ tradition that we then will imitate. And so, you know, in the sense of the icon, that gorgeous icon that you put up there, uh, it, it itself dies and we transcend into the world of the saint himself or into some relationship with the saint. You know, but that, you, you, you brought one of the like best possible images uh, in, also in the sense that it's, it's so visually um, stunning and lush. And I, I see a contradiction as I'm encountering that if I'm looking to transcend into the saint, I'm actually held by the amazing physical quality of it right there in the work, and I don't go any further. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a present reality. So I guess I'm drawing forth um, the, the grain of wheat dying metaphor in scripture, and then also the, uh, the Genesis affirmation that God said everything was good, so, so it doesn't need to be escaped from. Mm -hmm. So there's like, do things need to die and turn into something else, or can they just be good as they are mm -hmm. present? And so um, I guess what I'm doing is just drawing forth yeah. uh, two realities in the Christian life, yeah. and I see them both working there in kind of a, a contradiction. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's so much to say about all of that. That's a great set of observations. Um, I mean, wh where I'd start, I guess, is that it's, 
not that um, the seed, as it goes into the ground and dies, like, you know, denies itself and becomes so immaterial or it has to take on a new identity. It's rather that I think that there's a deep Christian logic of um, when the seed goes in the ground and dies and is, becomes a plant, um, it becomes more of itself, not less of itself. And so, um, and similarly, you know, the, the, the resurrected Christ is not um, a flight away from the world, but the resurrected Christ is one who um, has a body, eats, and dwells uh, for a while among those who have loved him. Um, so, but, so there's that part of it, but then there's also the part of it where there is gonna be this inescapable tension between how much the object draws you to something that is not the object, that is not reducible to the object, and how much the object just draws you to yourself. And that tradition of like that tension, it runs throughout Christianity and erupts at various moments where you have these different, particularly these different reform movements that are like, these illuminated manuscripts that are supposed to be drawing you into the life of Christ are just making you gaze at their beautiful gold pages. So the Sturgeons are like, no more illuminations. We'll have illustrated manuscripts, but none of this. And then, and then you'll get the, you know, you get the, the Franciscan and the Dominicans that are like, you know, this, this monastic life where you're supposedly taking these evangelical vows of uh, including poverty, like look at how rich you've gotten. Even if you don't individually possess it, you're collectively wealthy. So that's not the right way. So anyway, it just, um, you just get this, this like continual negotiation of like, look at all of these objects that can mediate and give Christ to us. And then those objects themselves becoming also the idols. They become the sources of temptation, right? Because anything that mediates Christ can also become um, something that blocks us from Christ at the same time. I mean, that, and that's true not just of images, that's true of, of people, that's true of nature, that's true of every single thing that's created can be sign of God or idol. Does anyone have one final question? Yeah, so what I really think that question got was an interesting point in our just overall collective vision and ability to hold things in tension mm. of how icons can image something that it is not, how it can kind of perform an apophatic theology with it. It's not the thing that it's trying to be or mediate to someone. So have you noticed anything either in um, just like the broader, I don't want to say culture, but a traditions that we're a part of that actually make it difficult to hold these tensions between these, it is, but it is not this like gray area. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, Yeah, there's so many things, I think, that make, a, make it difficult to live in that tension. Um, and I think part of it is, um, you know, part of what I've explored before is just our ecclesial lives and the ways that we are and are not formed to live well with, with images um, and live with that is versus the way that, that our ecclesial lives get caught up in polemics against others' ecclesial lives. I think that that can be something that keeps us from living into that, the sort of dynamism of Christian life. And I think it's also because uh, that dynamism is inevitably an invitation into something that's cannot fully be managed or con contained and is therefore um, somewhat threatening or scary. And so our own desires to threaten or manage things that are larger than ourselves is also gonna be just something that continually comes up over and over and again. And I think we, I think we're living in a time of particular fear about that. Particular fear, and particularly fear about things we can't contain. Thank you, Dr. Carnes. Yeah, thanks, y'all.